Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Michael Freeman. And if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, please check us out at youtube.com slash user slash curb anarchy on Monday at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the air, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues. And that's Wednesdays at 3 p.m. So uh, please also check out our Facebook page, and we have a thread posted there if you'd like to throw us any comments or questions. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. Yeah, so, Michael, we have Jeffrey Tucker tonight. Well, thanks for spilling the bean. Yeah. Yes, we do. I yeah. was going to say, hey, so we have a very special guest who you guys may know from the Mises Institute or Liberty Taught Me. A I, I don't theme. spoil anything. You want me to redo, no, you don't. To redo that? No, 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 no. Let's keep it organic, baby. <laughs> uh, a famed economist and libertarian anarchist within the movement who takes uh, an approach with the future and freedom that is in one of the more positive lights than I've ever seen, where I'm more of a a pessimist myself, and I'd, with all further ado, I'd like to welcome the esteemed Jeffrey Talker. <laughs> okay. Wow, well said. Yeah, that was that was well said. That was a nice introduction. Thank you so much. So right I, off the chest, too. Right off the chest, I have no script tonight. That's amazing. So you're just you should just improvise the whole of your life. Just, <laughs> that, that's how you should conduct your life. Just make it up as you go along. It works. So I'm I'm in Atlanta actually because I've been I've been sort of doing some work for the Foundation for Economic Education, and uh, this is a very cool organization, seventy years uh, seventy years old, and I've been hanging out at their offices and uh, trying to uh, radicalize their digital presence, which I think is going well. That's the goal. Radicalize the digital presence. Can you uh, can you explain what that means a little well, bit? You know, so our generation has been given these amazing tools, right? So we have, you know, this great migration out of the physical world into the digital world. We all live in it. We uh, that's 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 how we navigate the world. We're doing that right now, and this is a revelation. And I, what I would like to see is uh, for all freedom-minded organizations to to ramp it up a little bit and uh, uh, be more even more generous and 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 get ever more radical in their presentations of freedom ideas because I believe the nation state is a, is an artifact of history and in our lifetimes it's going to just continue to diminish and become obsolete and essentially irrelevant and um, you know we have the tools to make this possible through so through radicals cyber um, activism hacktivism and a general defiance of the of the elites so I'm trying to get the thinking in those terms, and I'm, I've had some success, I must say. Now, I've heard you... Yep, go ahead. I've heard you speak on... Uh, I don't want to try to quote you. I'm going to ruin that. Um, <laughs> that's... It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Sure. You know, I saw one of your panels at Porkfest, and I'm not going to, again, try to ruin the, the title of that, but, you know, you spoke as to the fact that Blockchain, th things like blockchain technology, bitcoins, dark coins, whatever variations of alternative competing currencies were going to set the future. And as you just mentioned, um, you think that, I'm not sure if you said that it's going to happen in, let's use your lifetime, but at least quickly diminish and, and highly diminish in your lifetime. Yeah. Uh, would you care? So yeah, could you there, there, here's, here's the two critical, if I could just like, sum up my case here uh, in a way that might even persuade you, I don't know. Um, oh, I'm persuaded already. Okay, so here's the, here's the critical thing. The state as an entity um, has two things that limit its range of effectiveness in this world. Uh, the first one is that it only deals in the physical world, like 
It can't control our minds. It can't control the world of ideas. It can't control um, anything that escapes the physical world. It only has tanks, only has guns, only has coercion. It only has the ability to, to, to kill us and beat us up and that sort of thing. I mean, it deals exclusively in the physical world. The second thing is that the state is always limited by uh, geography. Its jurisdictional range pertains only to its, um, uh, to its geographic limits of borders. And these are very uh, imposed limits on the state. So if we can find a way to bust down those two barriers, to get outside of the physical world on the one hand, and to get global and peer-to-peer -peer, um, that, that subvert the capacity of the state to stop us, then we've got the magic tools. And, and that's what we have. We didn't have these until, I mean, it's been gradually breaking down since about 1995, but in the last six years, uh, we've really seen the peer-to-peer -peer economy uh, globalize <coughs> and ever more sort of hurling us to a, self, a world of self-determination that's, that's lifted itself out of the limits of physical space and put itself into a distributed um, network that cannot be controlled ultimately by the state. And we see this every day, right? They try to take down Silk Road, Silk Road 2 comes along. They try to take, so, take down Silk Road 2, Silk Road 3 comes along, plus another dozen services, you know, that are out there. They try to kill Napster, uh, file sharing's all over the place. Um, they try, they try to, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, they try to suppress everything. They try to suppress, suppress free speech. They can't do it. I mean, they can grab individuals. They can make them exiled into Russia. They can put them in jail in New York. But all it does is inspire more resistance, and the state can't win this war. It just can't because of the limits of of its own sort of physical being. Um, and whereas we are now emerging as sort of ever more living digital lives. And that's why I think the states of the world are so panicked and why they become so vicious and wicked to us all the, all the time because, the, because they're, they're panicked about the end of the world. You know, one of the things, I, I, I don't know if, how, if you've read this really short novelette by Ayn Rand called Anthem. So it's, it's a story of a reactionary state that tries to hold back history by limiting our inventions and our access to new technologies. That's essentially what the state is doing to us now. But they can't keep us in cages. I mean, we love our technology. We love our new tools, and we use them, and we are individuals, and we're creative, and the state is uh, about the collective, and it's about um, the stasis. We're about uh, dynamics. So in the scheme of history, I don't think they can win the struggle. It's going to be very painful, to get from here to there, I'm, I'm certain of that, but I'm like wildly optimistic. I feel like for the first time, probably in the history of the world, <clears throat> we now have the, the magic tools that can that can free us finally. Because right. um, money is uh, a um, <clears throat> an indicator of how much money or how much work you've put into the market or labor and. Um, uh, it's also it's just trading, right? Um, so um, it, I guess money is supposed to be a concept, uh, a concept as opposed to a physical thing. Is that right? I, you know, um, that's one of the weird things that's happened in the last six years that we've discovered new things about money, right? We didn't know. We always used to think it was physical, that it had weight and it took up space, and we also more or less. Believe used to believe in the past that money was was necessarily monopolized by the state. Um, now, in the last look, I noticed 68 different cryptocurrencies that have a value above one dollar each. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be this um, <laughs> this close-minded anti-capitalist type of. Not that I knew what the the term meant, but you know, <laughs> anti-capitalist type of person. And in the past, honestly, six months, four months, maybe even, I've come to understand, at least subjectively for myself, that every single thing that any human does as a currency is a money, right? In my opinion, this conversation that we are having right now, and I I do make this point too often, but I can't, I just can't press this fact enough. Well, this opinion enough 
this very conversation is an exchange of ideas. We all place mutually beneficial guidelines on this or we wouldn't be participating in it and that is an exchange of ideas and if we are exchanging we are gaining from that and if that's not a currency I just don't know what is. Right. Maybe maybe it's more of a barter thing, maybe it's more of a direct peer-to-peer -peer trade exchange but I well, don't think that money is limited to representative currencies. I think it yeah. can be ideas, products, services. But you know, uh, F.A. Hayek said one time in 1974 that currency has been mostly monopolized by government for 6,000 years. 6,000 years. Right. And only within the last <coughs> or six years have we seen a model that allows us to take that away from the state. Like, this is happening in our time, like right now. I mean, this is a new chapter in history. It's, 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 it's unbelievable, it's breathtaking, and mind-blowing, and I, I think libertarians need to rally. Anybody who loves liberty needs to rally around these cryptocurrencies. It's enormously exciting. One of my favorite websites, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's called Brave New Coin. And it's like the, Bloom, the Bloomberg of cryptocurrency. So you can follow this stuff all the time. And you guys know that in the last six months, um, the regulators have been all, all over Bitcoin, right? Oh, yeah. And they're trying to figure out a way to control it. Well, in that time, there's a, a, an altcoin called Darkcoin, which is like super anonymous. Um, that's been rising in value like all the time. Uh, it's been the best cryptocurrency performing cryptocurrency over the last six months. So this, this is how this is how we roll now. <laughs> you know, the not... first we're like, whatever, let's just make something new. You know, right. yeah, I'll... I've never traded coin, and I, I can't say that I've watched it too closely. Um, however, if from and I can't be honest that this is my information, but the information that I have from my two, three pocket Bitcoin experts, Jamie, that's you, buddy. Um, <laughs> you know, Darkcoin's perf <laughs> Dark performing really well, and it's probably the most anonymous and, yeah. you know, as far as what we're going for for peer-to-peer -peer interaction, it's probably the safest cryptocurrency to use. Yeah, I think probably so. Um, there's other coins that are doing very well too. Pure coin, which is a little bit funny in a way, weird way. I mean, I laugh about it. Like Dogecoin, which is like a vanity, yeah. is actually like performing really well. So like whatever. Uh, when I first heard of Dogecoin, I thought it was a troll joke. I thought it was like it was. a, a <laughs> kind of this satire. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a satire. But you know, these days the difference between Satire in reality is a little bit blurry. <laughs> the The yeah. Onion tells more truth. The Onion tells more truth than CNN does. So yeah, that's yeah. right. That's a friend right. of mine uh, tried to get me into Dogecoin, and I tried to set up a, a mining unit on my laptop, and it, it can't it can't hold that kind of power. So uh, you know, I stopped using Dogecoin real quick, but it was fun. It was interesting. Got me into the whole uh, yeah. uh, crypto idea. Well, uh, a lot of Bitcoin miners uh, shifted their mining rigs over to, to mining Dogecoin um, in 2014 because the Dogecoin ended up being more profitable. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, uh, the Bitcoin space became overcrowded, you know. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty amusing. I, I, I just love the flexibility and the fact that this power is in our hands to actually mine money. You know, it's like, what? It's, you know. <laughs> well, at least I don't have to get my hands dirty. <laughs> yeah. It's so Jeffrey, wh Jeffrey, what do you think about this? Um, I believe it was overnight last night. Bitcoin shot right back up. Yeah. Um, well, it had bottomed out, I think. And what I, what I tend to do is, is watch the national press. And when the national press declares Bitcoin to be dead, that's definitely a bicycle. You know, and so that's what happened, right? We get down to like 172, and everybody's like, well, so much for Bitcoin, that's history. And there, there was a big flurry of stories that came out, of course, right? And uh, I just thought immediately when that happened, I thought, oh, this is very bullish for Bitcoin. And sure enough, you know, like a week later, you know, it's, it's hitting 270 again. You know, this is, this is the way it's going to happen. I, I, think, I think this could be a very good year for Bitcoin, actually. Um, 
So we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, and I have friends of mine who've been who've bought in at the low pay. You know, um, this is like good traders do it. You know, when the conventional wisdom shifts, they they buy. Uh, when the conventional wisdom is saying, "Oh, it's dead," they buy, and and then when the national press is saying, "Oh, this is the big new thing," then they sell. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can't believe I'm gonna just gonna call Jeffrey Tucker out, but I'm gonna do it. Oh. Um, just like every one of of them says that, does does every Bitcoin investor and profit not say that? I think it's gonna be a good year for Bitcoin. I know, and I, I was I was you know it's funny because like in 2013 I was like a like a like a like a profit, like I I you know it started at twelve dollars and it ended at twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, that like perfectly, and I should have known to never make another prediction because I was like because <laughs> uh, I expected it to continue going in 2014. I was completely wrong, totally wrong. Uh, there are a number of factors I didn't anticipate, which I, it's always easy in retrospect. Uh, when you do something right, like it, it inflates your ego, right? So you want to just keep on doing the right thing. So true, isn't it? It's so <laughs> I knew better than to than to to go with that, but I I did. I kept making predictions, and I was just dreadfully wrong. Um, I've never I've never made a correct call with Bitcoin, so I guess maybe I have one coming my way. <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, and let me just tell you, when you do make that right call, just never make another call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and on a high note. Yeah, yeah. So Leave while yeah, I'm on top. I was completely wrong about Bitcoin in 2014. I mean, what I didn't anticipate is that miners were, uh, a lot of miners got into deep debt with mining equipment. And so when they would mine the Bitcoin, they would immediately sell it into dollars to uh, convert it into debt service, really. So all the cloud mining operations became basically Bitcoin sellers. The other thing is that there was a huge amount of public adoption of Bitcoin in 2014, uh, but a lot of the adoption really amounted to um, accept, you know, using services like Coinbase and and BitPay to convert the the, the Bitcoin in, immediately into dollars upon uh, the point of purchase, which put a lot of selling pressure. So the irony is that Bitcoin actually fell because of the increased adoption of Bitcoin, which is something I don't think even the most sophisticated economist would have anticipated. It's clear in retrospect, but we didn't see it. I didn't see it at the time. Now it's very obvious. But now that we've gotten through this year, you know, it's looking pretty good. Um, you notice that the Wall Street Journal just read a, a huge special uh, uh, edition on, on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. The... Um, uh, Coinbase just came out with its first real trading, you know, NASDAQ regulated and approved. Who cares? But uh, I saw that for the first time this morning, as a matter of fact. Yeah, big trading platform on Bitcoin. Um, so, and there's other things that are coming, big things. Uh, like just today, I was talking with uh, the cryptocurrency expert in one of the top three. Um, uh, I guess you would say uh, investment banking houses uh, on Wall Street, and, she, and uh, he, she, I don't want to say, uh, is a big <laughs> expert, and uh, he or she is consulting with one of the fortune, one of the largest fortune companies, about um, equity uh, shares or distributing equity equity within the company on the blockchain. So there's some big stuff happening. Yeah, big stuff. And, and you know that's that's all about that's sort of getting around SEC regulations <coughs> and reinventing stock markets, which are not free. You know, yeah. so uh, within blockchain technology, we see a kind of a highway to, to liberty. It's not going to happen immediately, but it's it's going to happen in the next five years. But we're living in times of like, extraordinary upheaval. I mean, here's the deal: when you touch the money, you touch the very source of the lifeblood of the, of the economic life. And Satoshi's invention, now six years old, uh, really was a, a kind of a new chapter in the history of the world. It's just a matter of you know, seeing the thing uh, uh, develop, develop itself out, uh, as it will, over the next five, six years. 
Yeah, I, I have one big question. I'm going to let Josh take it after this. I, I don't want to overdo myself. Uh, I know he's he's a huge fan of yours. I mean, a, as well as I am. Um, but I, Jeffrey, I know you've been well. You've been anarchying for quite a while now. Yeah. I'm just curious to hear your uh, your spin on. You know, I'm sure when you started doing this. Can I can I go as be as bold to say 40, 30, 40 years ago? Well, maybe a little too long, but uh, uh, too bold. <laughs> uh, 30, 30 years is not entirely incorrect. Okay, so in the past thirty years, um, I'm sure when you started doing this, it was uh, slow, much slower going. Yeah, and you you've seen the phenomenons like the internet come about and from their social media from their things like open source pirate you know pirate bay on um, the deep web like tor uh, blockchain technology can you can you say that things have been is business booming for anarchy right now or, or is the tide changing from your uh, oh, elongated yeah. perspective oh it's just crazy right and and a lot of it has to do with technology i think you're exactly right um, it's changed everything, and uh, I used to think that we had to win an ideological revolution um, to get to where we want to go. I no longer believe that. I think that, that the ideology is built into the technology, and the technology is so superior that I think it's, it's, um, it makes our job a lot easier than I ever imagined. The other thing is that in the past, before the Internet, because uh, you're right, I got into this business... 1985 or so, you know, um, and I uh, underestimated the power of ideas, uh, and the internet has un unleashed that in, in so many ways that we couldn't possibly have anticipated. Um, you know, that was a bad, bad world, uh, the 1980s. The, it was the thick of the Cold War, the state ran everything. Now it's like anarchy is breaking out all over. The most beautiful way. Nobody controls the world, and can even pretend to control the world anymore. And um, that's just beautiful, you know. But you know, in saying that, I don't want to belittle the fact that there are a lot of victims along the way. My dear friend Ross Holbrook is right now suffering in prison. He's being oppressed by the state. Uh, there are dozens of other people who are suffering. Now, Ross Ulbrich, if I understand correctly, is he may have actually admitted this, I'm not sure, but he is alleged to be the Dread Pirate Roberts. He did come forth, I believe, and say that he was the initial creator of the Silk Road, but it's still okay. debatable as to whether or not he was running it at the time of these said investigations and yeah, right. seizures of property. Yeah, and, and before the Silk Road was founded, Ross uh, wrote me, and we had a nice discussion um, on email. Uh, about uh, about the platform that he's considering putting up, and um, you know, my advice to him is uh, be careful. You know? and um, so I think he's a real martyr for our cause. I I, I hope he's going to get off on this trial. I hope so, uh, uh, but maybe not. You know, I, I mean, we'll just have to see what happens. Um, but there's a lot of victims along the Ross is only one of them, and it's very sad and very tragic. <laughs> but nonetheless, in the sweep of things, these people are great innovators. They're great pioneers and entrepreneurs. They're forging for us a new world. And that world is going to come about no matter how many people the state puts in jail, no matter how many people the government oppresses. Uh, they can't take the technology away from us. That's what's beautiful about it, right? I mean, the cat is out of the bag. The technology exists. The blockchain exists. Uh, the deep web exists. And nobody can shut it down. The government knows this. Well, <clears throat> my question is, uh, the thing is, the government uses the same technology that we do as anarchists, and uh, though we're pushing a message, it's pushing back, and people are, it seem, they seem more inclined to be tribal, and, um, you know, they just clamor for more government or, you know, support the government and whatever it does to s strike down anarchists or whatever. Well, you know, um, my friend Mary Rothbard used to always point out to me that the, the state is the 1%, we are the 99%, you know? So, yeah, they have the same tools, but they don't have the same level of crowdsourced knowledge we have. That's why they're restrained by bureaucracy. 
Well, we're not. I gotta, I gotta touch in on this, Jeffrey. You say your friend Murray Rothbard. Yeah. Do you could you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh sure. Uh, yeah. No, he and I were uh, very good friends, and we talked several times a week uh, for about ten years before his death uh, on the phone, and we used to go to the movies together and do the theater together and, and stuff like that. That's awesome. And, yeah. He's a very sweet man. Um, always loved liberty very deeply and, and passionately. Uh, reckless and dangerous intellectual, but <laughs> but, uh, but uh, wildly opt optimistic for human liberty. And he always knew he always knew there was something in the, the spirit of, of of humankind that would prevail against coercion. He always knew that, and he always tried to impart that to people. He was a he was a revolutionary, you know. He was, the number one enemy of the state. He, he was a true revolutionary and um, a, a genuine and true radical. Uh, not, a, not, a, not a perfect strategist, not a perfect human being, but um, a true pioneer and a great pioneer. And he never stopped being wild and crazy. That was Murray. <laughs> speaking, um, of, speaking of great innovators, um, you know, Josh and I had mentioned earlier that you were a fellow of the, the Mises Institute, and I know that, or maybe even senior, we're not entirely sure, so I know that Josh wanted to sure. really peg your brain on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know um, uh, where, uh, what your titles were at Mises Institute, um, and are you still there? Um, and let's talk about liberty.me, too. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just uh, maybe I'll just go through my own, my own career here. So I went to work at the Institute uh, pretty pretty early on uh, and uh, was in the editor of their publications before the Internet came along. When the Internet came along, I, I built the website and built out its forums and uh, its wikis and its store and put in, you know, when I've been a pioneer in putting up online books and that sort of thing. And um, I left in about 2011. I became vice president, but I wanted to get into uh, uh, the private, uh, the for-profit sector. So I went to work for Leslie Fair Books, where I still am. And then um, I was so intrigued by that that I started Liberty.me, which is a commercial service. Uh, it's a publishing service. It's very much an open-source platform. I I wanted to um, uh, uh, get rid of the gatekeepers and the editors. And, and start a, a, a real social media platform where th amazing things could happen. And then more recently, I've been working uh, very closely with, with Foundation for Economic Education. So I basically have three titles now, uh, Chief Liberty Officer of Liberty.me, a Distinguished Fellow at, at Foundation for Economic Education, and Executive Editor of Leslie Fair Books. So yeah, I've done a, a, a lot of stuff. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, that's my question. What is a CLO? Yeah, I okay. So I made up the title, right? <laughs> it's it's very fashionable these days not to have a conventional title like CEO and CEO and all this nonsense. So nowadays, um, really cool companies like to have people make up titles. So I made up that title, and I attached it to myself. But yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm the founder. So when you're the founder, you call yourself what you want. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. On. Yeah, so I called myself that. Um, but um, you know, I, I really do feel like we're at the beginnings, and I had a good day today because we we're, were applauding over applauding to do amazing things in the next 18 months in the digital spaces. You know, I really believe in this. And the beautiful thing about the digital world is that it doesn't have any limit. You know, it's limited only by what we can imagine. Imagine, you know. So yeah, that's beautiful, and and they're they're kind of um, hoping that I can lead an effort to. Uh, uh, take the 70 year old organization and curl it into the in a big way. And I'm excited about doing that. I, I you know, it's funny, I was discussing today with the executive, um, uh, with the, with the chief executive, uh, what is it, the executive director of the CEO of the um, uh, And they wanted me to head this and you have to do some introspection, like what do you really love? And, and at the end of the day, I love writing, I love speaking, but more than anything else, I love building. You know, um, I love to make gigantic digital contraptions. In this that's, that's what I dream about. 
That's what, that's what makes my heart you know, beat. That's, that's what I wake up thinking about, you know. And so, you know, it's it's a grace for me to be asked to, to be head of project. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know where it's going to lead, you know, and I don't know where living is going to lead, but that's the fun thing about it. You know, it's like it's like the future is always uncertain but full of promise. And it really is what we want to make it, you know, especially these days. Uh, we have all the tools. It's all a matter of how much energy we put in, how much imagination we bring to the project. Um, there's no limit to what we as libertarians can do. I mean, this is our moment. If we don't fucking do this now, it will not be done. It's our job. Future yeah. generations may not thank us. I don't care. The point is that we have to do this because it's we have the tools. We are right. so good. Right. Yeah. But I, I, go ahead. Go, Michael. Okay. Go. Don't don't wave your hand at me like that with your ANCOM colors over here. Did, did, oh, you, have wow. bowling? Yeah, did you have bowling? Uh, did you have bowling tonight or? Wait, bowling? No, it looks like. I mean, to the general audience, yeah. Look at your color, man. It looks like you were at a bowling league. Um, so no, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> so uh, Jeffrey, as I've heard you touch a few times tonight uh, as a counterpoint or backup point to your. Um, your own ideas is that you think terrible things are going to happen along the way or violence is going to happen along the way. Maybe people, I don't want to ruin your quotes as I tend to do. Um, but that's, that's, that's what I think may happen first, unfortunately. Like, you know, blockchain technology is great. And, you know, call it blockchain, call it whatever you want to. I, I just base it to open source and peer-to-peer, -peer, like yeah. free open ideas, whether it's on the interwebs or on paper or in a, a open voice audible forum, whatever, whatever. Um, however, I'm pretty sure that the government has more guns and better guns and bigger bombs and more people who are willing to do whatever they tell them than any other force in the entire world. And when I say that, I mean the American government and their subsidiaries or alternative sects like, I don't know, NATO or whatever, right? The CFR and all this good stuff. Um, yes, I think that blockchain technology and open source technology is changing the world and is advancing freedom in a way that, that humanity has never, ever seen before. Um, and it's only increasing every single day. Every day there's 10, 20, 30... I make a new anarchist every day, so I can imagine that Jeffrey Tucker makes at least 10, right? Yes. Um, however, when it all comes down to it, I'm, pr I'm afraid that with all of our good ideas and all of our peer-to-peer -peer and voluntary interaction and peaceful association leading to better ideas and better technologies and forwarding society as a whole, the government will kill anybody who tries to do this what, when it comes down to their real collapse, right? Yeah. I don't mean where we are now. Like, yes, they are dissolving and they are hurting and I'm pretty sure that they're aware of it and our ideas of peace and freedom are spreading by the second. But once it comes down to the state is going to dissolve over philosophical uh, idea ideologues opposing the state, they're going to start to black bag people. They're going to start to drop bombs. They're going to start to round people up. I, I'm afraid. I, I'm not going to get into conspiracy well, theories. I don't well, do I, that. But. I agree. And, and, and uh, it's a serious problem. The beautiful thing about it is at least we can know about it, right? Whereas in the past, the state's always been evil since the ancient world, right? But it's just we didn't know all the evil that they did. Now, you can't get away with shit, you know. It's gonna be a <laughs> no. They can. Twitter, and, you know, and we can bring the massive public pressure, and knowledge is power. I agree with. I totally agree with you, and and that's totally my point. Like, I'm pretty sure within ten, fifteen years, like everybody in the, the majority of people in the world who aren't affiliated with the state are going to understand that it's illegitimate. But what happens then? You know, there are certain things that the state is going to do in order to quell dissent and quell well, it's collapse. That's what a state does. It expands and it survives. I think is like the first uh, the first principles of its existence. Yep. And yeah, I'm just afraid for what's gonna how that's gonna play out. Like I don't like death. I don't like violence. Not either. 
Right. Pretty and, sure we're going to see a lot of it before it collapses. Uh, it very well could be, but you know the thing is that nowadays the state can't get away with anything like what it used to do. You know, and 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 we've got we've got Twitter, we've got we've got uh, we've got uh, the communication technologies are so outrageously efficient um, that you know we have the advantage that we have the knowledge, and also we are the ninety nine percent. Well, that's what really matters. They're the one percent. It's always the minority. It's true they have the monopoly on guns, but in the end, ideas more powerful than guns. Mises taught us this. So he saw this. He knew this was true, and ideas move faster. Counterpoint, though. Yeah. Uh, only because um, a lot of people are still watching, um, you know, Fox and CNN and right. believe in that mainstream crap. And you know, the technology spreads this information, but they just, you know, they're either dissonant or they're just totally uh, outside of this box and not even paying attention to either the media or the internet. And um, That's true, but you know, most of the technologies that people are rallying around these days are entirely uh, private sector generated. The state really hasn't done anything for humanity, like ever, but, <laughs> right. uh, but like in a big splashy sort of phony way since about like 1963. Really, almost everything that they've done since that point has been has been a, a massive failure. I mean, I watched the State of the Union the other night. I don't know if you watched this crap, but I, I happen to watch it, right? I was uh, going to for a drinking game, but I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the one thing I have to say about that State of the Union, I didn't write this. I, I, I criticized it unrelentingly. But basically, it was the most humble State of the Union I've ever seen in terms of the, uh, his promises and his claims for himself, it was way toned down from anything I'd heard from from uh, Clinton or Bush or, the, or any other Obama address or Reagan or any of these other assholes. Um, and I think the reason for that is that his advisors told him, look, people are pretty down on the government right now. You're going to have a better chance of success if you just lower expectations. So he resorted to a, a, a series of cliches, you know, okay, there's a call for, like, national child care or whatever, but that's just bullshit. I mean, mostly it was, it was a, a, um, a very humble address uh, as compared to any I've, I've seen in my lifetime. And I think that's an indication of the ideological change. I mean, politicians are very good at marketing themselves, you know, so you can, you can find out, uh, if you listen very carefully to what they're saying, uh, what the mood of the public is, and I think I think I think the mood of the public is just sick of this. You know, all the all the cool toys are invented by the private sector. The state hasn't done shit for us except rob us all the time. You know, and I think growing consciousness. I I think. I th I think that at the very best case, and even prior to I I think you said 1963, yeah. um, even prior to then, I think that the only thing that the state ever did was redistribute wealth. They certainly never created anything. They certainly never generated <laughs> revenue outside of extorting other people. So I don't see why, you know, I, I'm just not sure that I see a difference between pre 1963 to post 1963. Well, it's just aside, in the past, like at the moonshot, everybody thought, oh my God, the government is so great. It's putting us into space, right? And then in World War II, it's like, oh, thank God for governments protecting us from evil uh, Nazis that were taking over Europe. And uh, before then, it was like, oh, isn't the government great? It's bringing democracy to the world and taking us to the Great Depression and so on. I mean, it's hard to say there's anything that's happened in the last 40 years that it's on that scale. Well, I understand, but, you know... I'm a, a veteran of the military, right? And I've been overseas and done the expeditionary thing, right? And all the kids who have, well, previously blocked me on the internet and post uh, blocked my stuff and reported me to Facebook and discommunicated me from their circles um, are under the impression that we would all be speaking, I don't know, Iraqi or, you know, whatever language if it wasn't for our sacrifices. Were you and, were actually in the military? Oh God! <laughs> I was, I was, yeah. But you're, you're like, you're like 17. How could you be in the military? Oh, here. All right, all right, man. And you just like talked down on me for saying that you were too old. Okay. <laughs> I'm a uh, <laughs> no, Jeffrey. I'm 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 20. I'm 27. I was in the army for about six years or so. Wow. Where did you serve? 
Uh, I did both. I, I did Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, I'm glad you're still around. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to hear the story of your, your uh, ideological uh, enlightenment. I'll give you a very brief overview because we are starting yeah. to get hounded for time. Um, I was in the army. I went to combat. I started to get divorced and I started to leave combat and realized that well, freedom of speech had absolutely nothing to do with pointing guns at people in Afghanistan or Iraq who had never posed a threat to me in any way, shape, or form and understand what was going on with that. And, uh, you know, I came home from that and eventually found the Alex Jones train of thought and FEMA camps and all that madness, which eventually led me to Ron Paul, which eventually led me to Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, and the like, to Jeffrey Tucker. Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, went to Porkfest this past June and was just kind of done from there. Wow, that's really, that's really thrilling. Do you feel better? Oh, I feel great. You know, when I was in the military, I was angry and sad. When I was a conspiracy theorist, I was angry and paranoid. Now that I do anarchy, I laugh at all of, all of these clowns, so <laughs> I have a blast. I just wanted to know... Um, you know, just trying to change up the subject a little bit. Um, up here in the Northeast, today being Monday uh, the 26th, um, because this is going to post uh, the 28th. Um, so tonight, up here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, where we are, it's snowing. <laughs> it's snowing hard. It, we're supposed to get about two feet worth. Um, and So that's pretty tall. But we're used to it up here in New England. I've had it all my life, um, and over the past, I want to say two or three years, we've had snow bans where, y you know, normally we can't park on the street, but now we can't drive on the street because, you know, oh boy, there's a blizzard. Um, I, again, I've driven in it all my life, well, as long as I was legally allowed to. You get arrested um, if, you, if you go out and you start driving, then they, you're a criminal, right? Precisely. At midnight tonight, um, two hours from now, we're not allowed on the street. So, um, so much for. So I want to bring this. Go ahead. So, go much ahead. Public, so, so much for public roads. It's it's funny. People talk about the evils of private roads. It's like, no, you can't have a private road because they would they would keep you off of it pending payment. You know that would be a terrible eventuality. Well, actually, we're being kept off public roads all the time, right? It's just nice. it's, it stays in charge of it, and, and they instead of instead of dinging your credit card, they arrest you and put you in jail. You know, so it's a big right. difference between the public and the private sector. Yeah. Um. So I I guess I bring this up um, because um, we found that you know you wrote a, a article about driving drunk on the road as well, <laughs> and um, so they go hand in hand. And I what I guess what I want to talk about is public roads in general. You know, let's. Uh, enough of the preamble. Let's just talk about public versus private in general. I, so yeah. What you, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> drinking and driving is one thing. I just have like some angry little rants I need to get off my chest on this one. Um, <laughs> because I'm an hour shy of you, right? And and yeah. I am being threatened with the, the same thing. And what we're really talking about here, they can call it protection. They can call it keeping the public safe and the collective in good terms or whatever they want to call it. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm being threatened with fucking murder if I go drive on the road after midnight. So right. what they are really suggesting here is that they are going to threaten to kill me in order to keep me safe. So I, I have a fucking problem with the whole notion. And I, I apologize for getting upset with that. I just have a problem with when people threaten to end my life. Yeah, it's yeah. control. Out and out. It's control versus, you know, your own... You it's know, also... A, no I, I find it very strange. There's a presumption of knowledge that's embedded in the state. They always think they know what's better for you than you know, which, like, like where did this knowledge come from? You know, some some great god, you know, descended upon every governor and mayor and gave them, embedded them with some amazing sense of to know exactly what the plan should be and denied us access to this knowledge. I mean, this is a mistake. It's a, an epistemological problem, essentially. It's the state doesn't have, Yeah, I mean, it's, the state has no special knowledge to manage society. And um, this is the great lie. 
like people believe this. They think that uh, because the government is powerful and they have resources, or that they wear nice suits or whatever kind of shit, uh, that somehow they have special uh, adequacy to, to manage the world. And it's just a, a lie. I mean, the knowledge that makes society work is embedded within our hearts and in our brains, right? It extends out of our circumstances of time and place. Only we are in a position to make that kind of uh, judgments for ourselves. It's not, to me, just... It's not just a matter of rights, which are very important. It's, a, it's an epistemological problem. <clears throat> Society works because of the diffusion of knowledge and the institutions that emerge from that firmament of the social order that extract that knowledge, however limited, and embed it in institutions like um, prices and customs and that kind of thing, as, as Hayek said. The state really does stand outside this system with a kind of presumption that it knows, but it's a liar. I mean, every state is a liar. It doesn't really know what's, what's good for us, and it's and it's not in, really in a position to say um, what we should and shouldn't shouldn't do. We, you and I don't always know what we should and shouldn't do, but uh, we have a much better chance of getting the answer right than the state does. So, I mean, to me, the state is like this gigantic epistemological failure. Because it doesn't have access to the knowledge that you and I have. I mean, you, I mean, you would know whether or not you can navigate these roads tonight at midnight. I mean, you would have a better sense of that than the governor of Massachusetts. You know? Yeah, these these cookie cutter, um, generalized limitations or or protections or. Uh, you know, you're allowed to do this isms um, that come from this state just don't apply. You you can't say that. You know, Josh is a much bigger kid than I am, even though I probably drink seventy times more than he does. Right? There's no way to say that Josh can't drink six beers and I can't drink three, and that we're going to be driving at the same amount of um, mental, you know, incompetence or or lack of motor skills or whatever. Right. I had a funny thing happen to me this morning. I was driving into Atlanta, and have you ever done this before when you've been driving along? And I have a thing here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, it's one of these. Um, so I, I wanted to get one of these out, which is a uh, a set of earbuds. Have you ever tried to untangle earbuds while you drive? <laughs> That's yes. the most distracting thing you could ever do. <laughs> For sure. I mean, I was like, you know, like this. And I'm driving. I'm, yeah. um, like, I would have been way safer driver after three martinis. That <laughs> was when I was trying to undo my earbuds while I was driving. And my first thought was, if the state really wants, believes that it's making, uh, making uh, the road safe, it wouldn't be alcohol they would target. It would be things like being sleepy while you drive or untangling earbuds or being distracted or talking to your your girlfriend or, you know, whatever kind of thing is, else is going on with your girlfriend. I mean, there would be a lot of things that would be illegal if the state really was concerned about distracted driving. They target alcohol mainly because of, I think, a, a latent puritanism in the American spirit. I mean, don't forget, and the three of us should never forget this. This is the country, the United States of America, that made it illegal to... Um, uh, produce and distribute for at a profit any alcoholic spirits, including wine and beer, for like 12 years in the, during the 20th century. That's how insane this country is about yeah. this country. We still have blue laws up here in Massachusetts. Uh, you can't buy uh, alcohol on Sunday like after noon or something like that. Uh, uh, it's so stupid because you can buy in the morning. But wait a minute, do you not understand that that's going to cause you to go to heaven? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'd like to point out about the, the headphones or, or being sleepy while driving, or which are clearly more, um, more likely to cause bodily harm to yourself or other people, not that the state has any room to protect you from yourself. Um, I think what's fancy to them and what they appreciate about it is it's a measurable thing. Like, okay, obviously their breathalyzers are not, you know, you can't trust them and the, the technology is obsolete and defunct as far as I'm concerned. But 
you cannot regulate whether somebody is sleepy. You cannot measure that with a device. Or, well, okay, maybe they can, but it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars compared to right. breathalyzers or something. Like, how are you going to regulate untwisting your earbud headphones? Like, right. the police are going to have a tough time with that. We're something we're drinking and driving where they can attempt to calculate and attempt it's such to... That's intrusion, right? They're like, oh, let me check what's in your bloodstream now. <laughs> it's my special little um, scientific measuring stick. And then and then take you to prison, you know, depending on how the results turn out. It's yeah. So outrageous. I, yeah. I've, I've, I've known people who, to, get, to get arrested and jailed after arriving at their own home safely yeah. and being followed by a cop and arrest them out of the driveway. I mean, it's, it's, Wouldn't you just want them to get home and safe in the first place? Just let them go, you know? Who cares? You know, just go like this, you know? <laughs> Until somebody is victimized, I, I see absolutely no problem. Until you've destroyed property, a person, or, in you know, stopped somebody maybe from, I don't know. You know okay, that, that's slippery, but... One Until you've destroyed per person or property, I don't think you've done anything wrong. Well, and, and you know, one of the biggest protections against actually dangerous drunk driving is, is services like, like Lyft and Uber, right? I mean, in Los Angeles, it has been very liberal in its regulations towards Uber. Um, drunk driving arrests have just plummeted. So in, in the town in which I live right now, they banned Uber. Now, I live in a college town where, like, probably two-thirds of everybody on the road after... 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. is drunk, you know, like they could not. So it becomes a huge source of revenue. For every single person they stop uh, that they can arrest for DWI, the state's going to get seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 out of them, right? So if you had Uber, if you made uh, Uber legal, then all these people would just be pressing a button on their cell phones and calling somebody to get them home, you know, or get them to the bar and back again. Um, so I have this real deep suspicion, and it's deeply cynical, that one of the reasons the local government uh, drove Uber out was because they were afraid of the revenue loss associated with DUI. So I have not written this up yet, um, because it's pretty outrageous speculation, but it makes sense to me. The government makes a lot of money from drunk driving. They want more of it, not less. Sure. To switch back to uh, the snow issue here, um, the thing is, uh, they're trying to get money out of us or just to control us. And I think that drunk driving thing is, you know, it's all control and everything like yeah. that. And I, it's based on superstition and um, exterior knowledge that doesn't exist and all this. Um, but the thing is, it, it harkens back. Massachusetts was the place with uh, the Boston Marathon thing. And all of this, actually the first time that they instated this uh, snow ban thing, I believe was either just before, yeah, I think it was the winter just before the Boston Marathon incident. So um, I think it's just a big progression. They're getting ready for something huge in Massachusetts, or that's my conspiratorial crap going on. But outrageous? Think, you can't leave your home right now. I mean, in, a, in an hour or so. You yeah. Can't. I mean, it's basically like martial law, basically. Right. The weather. Absolutely. Well, it is. It, no, it, it exactly. It's not basically. I think. I think it exactly is. You yeah. will be threat. Look, they're going to pull you over, right? If you try to travel right now, and what happens if you don't comply to being pulled over? They're going to try to run you off the road. And what happens if you don't comply to that? They're going to physically assault you. And what doesn't? What happens if you don't comply with that? They're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. So what's really happening here? And I can't press this fact enough. I really can't. But what's really happening here is we are th being threatened with murder in order to keep us safe. And I just cannot wrap my head around it. And that's exactly what happened just outside, or actually all of greater Boston. Uh, it was the perimeter of that. That happened for maybe two or three days, uh, that Boston Marathon incident. And that's what's happening with the snow ban. And that's what's happening with the previous snow ban and the one before that. So it's... Uh, it's a little unnerving, and I can't wait to move to Nashua in you know <laughs> in the summer. Like I, I gotta get out of Massachusetts. Oh you man, know, it's, it's just a, a one state away, right? But you feel it. Well, actually, ten minutes. Oh, that's amazing. But you've crossed the border many times. You, I felt it, right? Driving from the Boston yeah. airport into Massachusetts, you feel a sense of 
of a, 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 an increase of freedom or at least a reduction of the amount of tyranny. Yeah, it, it's in the air. It's like uh, the pollution is less. The uh, you can feel the mountain air when you go up north enough, and it's like oh, it's so refreshing. Like you're like you said, own guns. Oh. You can drive faster than you can there. You don't have to worry about things like state tax. Yeah. You don't have to worry yeah. about things like martial law. I mean, I'd say there's a lot of a lot of incentives there. Oh, yeah. The only downside of Massachusetts that I've uh, to uh, New Hampshire that I found is that my cell phone just literally shuts off. Uh, like, yeah, Jeffrey, I do. I use Metro PCS, and when I was at Porkfest this year, I did not have a lick of service by two hours outside of Lancaster, New Hampshire. So. I was the same. I use AT and T, and I I was just completely shut down. It was pretty shocking. Ugh. I mean, even my GPS stopped working. I had to stop off at a gas station to ask directions. Like, <laughs> oh, it, yeah. like it was the 1850s. So, you know, <laughs> the question is, is that freedom or is uh, the technology freedom? So, you know, both. Like, both. You know, both, you know. <laughs> I know. You want both, right? We just, we, we all, what can we do? We struggle to get towards the future. Uh, we claw our ways. Uh, That's it. Way, step by step into a future of individualism, self-determination, where we have both technology and we don't have to obey the fascists who are running this country. But I, I'm on your side, Jeff. I'm a programmer. You know, I I, uh, I have a website and all this other stuff. You know, I, I love this stuff. So. What language do you write in? What's your language? Um, I program C++, C Sharp, ASP, all this, all this stuff. Fine. So. Yeah, I program in uh, in Facebook and, and YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, good stuff. So um, real quick, I'm going to uh, wrap up the show with the prices. And um, uh, Jeff, if you could stay on uh, until we end the show. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, last time we did the show was January 19th. Uh, and tonight it's January 26th. We're live. Um, and I took the prices at 7.52 tonight. Last time the silver was 17.68. Tonight it was 17.73, so it went up five cents. That's 0.3 percent. Uh, gold went from 12.75.30 to 12.73.41. That is a dollar and 89 cent change. That's 0.1 percent. Bitcoin went from 2.11.93 to 2.65.92. That's a 53.99 dollar uh, cent. 53.99 cent came. That's 25.5%, quite a bit. It's impressive. So um, do, you, do you look at the site uh, called Brave New Coin ever? Uh, no, I haven't heard of it. Yeah, it's out of New Zealand. I, I love it because it carefully, carefully tracks all the altcoins, and I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I, I watch it constantly. It's just fun. Brave New Coin. Right on. Jeffrey, thank you for being on the show. It was great having you. It's good um, to be your crypto friend. Thank you so much for for all your work. I I I, I think you're you're both really quite amazing. I'm glad you're doing this podcast and your hearts are really in it. Let's build a really future together. And I look forward to seeing you in New Hampshire very soon. Um, I look I forward to seeing you at Porkfest, Jeff. It's gonna be amazing. <laughs> um, we we do have a uh, question for you. In uh, one week, we have a um, uh, roundtable discussion uh, with um, a few of our friends and past guests. If you'd be interested. Yeah, uh, no, this is I would have to check my calendar and see. Um, I have some sense I'm going to be somewhere this next weekend. I think I'm going to be in Miami of all places. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want you to drop me an email. I'd, I'd, I'd like to be here. I, I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you so much for for having me and, and listening to me go on and on. I really <laughs> no, we, we appreciate you being here, Jeffrey. Thank you that's so much. Fun. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, All the best to you. Can you um can you uh just uh give us a couple websites uh we can be pointing yeah. to? Yeah, so um Liberty.me has really improved. We've we've really um, uh, made our social uh much more robust. I'm having a blast and we also have new apps for Android and, and iPhone now. Uh, you can go over there, get a thirty day free trial, uh, past that it's five bucks a month. I mean it's two hundred bucks. Uh, nightly classes. It's it's a lot of fun. If you love liberty, it's a great place for you. Also, I'm a big supporter of the Foundation for Economic Education. I'm working for them right now. 
I also work for Laissez Faire Books. Um, mostly, I post personally at tucker.liberty.me. Um, I consider myself uh, just one of the many thousands of people at liberty.me with a website. So, if you like my stuff, uh, I'm glad for you to go over there and check it out. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so Michael, um, we have the roundtable discussion next week, and um, yeah. yeah, so uh, that's that was easy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, well, I hope to see you next week if it works out. I, I'm, I think I'm flying back into town on Sunday night, so I might be able to do um, uh, Monday. Jeffrey, it's it's no worries. Look, just go make me more free, and we'll figure that out later on. <laughs> uh, Y'all uh, take care tonight, all right? All right, take care. Be safe. Uh, yeah, so, Michael, that's about it. Uh, the next show, um, real quick, the next show will be February 2nd. Um, that is one week from now. And this show will be uh, at Voluntary Virtues, on Wednesday at 3 p.m. That's the 28th. So uh, thank you all for watching. Take care. All right. Peace, guys.